Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, verse 14. Again, John chapter 1, verse 14. Last week's text was described as a turning point. That was because there was a sharp and welcome transition. And that transition was from bad news to good news. The bad news was the sweeping rejection of Christ. We were told that the world did not know him and that his own, that is the people of Israel, did not receive him. Therefore, the reader was left to wonder, is mankind left hopeless? If the world will not know him and his own countrymen would not receive him, is the human race doomed and left to face condemnation? But then, last week, we were given good news. And that was the turning point of this 18-verse prologue. Some will receive Christ and be saved. At verse 12, we read this. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Those who receive Christ, who accept him in faith, are born again. And with that spiritual rebirth, become the children of God. But we are also told that becoming the children of God is not something we do. The spiritual rebirth is not something we accomplish. Instead, we were clearly told that this is a work of God. In verse 13, we were told that those who believe in his name were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If that was the turning point of John's introduction, we might call today's text his grand finale. That is because in this concluding passage, of his introduction, he now makes his great reveal. In this passage, John will now identify the one he has previously referred to as the Word, the life, and the light. And that, of course, is our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. Let's look, please, at John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. <clears throat> the opening verse of this concluding section of John's prologue has been described as one of the most important verses in the Bible. In this verse, 14 begins, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This verse provides a concise statement concerning the supremely important doctrine of the Incarnation. 
And by incarnation, we mean that God himself took on human flesh to come in the form of one of his created beings. It is the ultimate expression of humility and of love that God would come as one of us, not only to dwell among us, but to sacrificially give his life for us. This is the first reappearance of this important title, the Word, since it was first introduced in verse 1. In verse 1, we were introduced to that title, the Word, and we discovered that it referred to God the Son who existed from eternity past and was with the Father. And let's also bear in mind that this title, the Word, carries with it the idea of communication. We communicate through our words. By referring to God the Son as the Word, it indicates that God wants to make himself known, to reveal himself to mankind. Now we learn that this eternally existent God, the Word, has come in the flesh. This is a surprising term that John uses, the flesh. We might expect him to say, the word became a man, or the word came in a human body. But instead, John says, he became flesh. John's first readers would have thought this a harsh, perhaps even a vulgar term, to think of God taking on human flesh. And it is not hard for us to imagine that reaction. And that is because when we see the word flesh in other areas of scripture, it is usually with a negative connotation. And that is because, as we are told by scripture, the flesh is weak. Right? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But the human body and its flesh are not by necessity sinful. Hebrews 4 says that Christ is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted in every way just as we are and yet was without sin. When the word became flesh, he dwelt among us. This statement that speaks of the word dwelling among us is very important. And it is especially important because it is certain that John has in mind some very specific Old Testament imagery. This word dwelling could be translated for us as pitched his tent. The word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. The Old Testament connection becomes even clearer if we were to say he tabernacled among us. In the days of the Exodus, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, they were told by God to construct a tabernacle, a tent of meeting. And when it was set up, it was reported in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, I think you're going to like this. That glory that filled the tabernacle came to be linked with the Hebrew word Shekinah. Consequently, when referring to God's glory, we sometimes hear the word Shekinah glory. And that phrase, Shekinah glory, will sometimes be used to describe God's radiant glory of his, of his perfect holiness. But this phrase, Shekinah glory, doesn't translate to glory, glory, that is because the Shekinah, the word Shekinah, doesn't mean glory. 
The word Shekinah means dwell. And to dwell somewhere means to be present in that place. And so the phrase Shekinah glory really means dwelling glory. Shekinah glory could be understood like this. As God dwells in this place, his glory is made known. When the word of God, I'm sorry, when the, the word, when the word, Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us, the glory of God was no longer in a tabernacle or in a temple. The glory of God was made present in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's return to verse 14 and continue to the next clause. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld what his glory. The Shekinah glory came in Christ, and we beheld his glory, his dwelling glory. And we beheld that glory. As John says, we beheld his glory, he's speaking of physical sight. That's beheld. He's speaking of physical sight. He's not speaking in terms of dreams or of spiritual visions. He's speaking instead of beholding his glory. He's speaking of witnesses, many witnesses, seeing that glory and seeing it with their eyes. At the beginning of John's first letter, not this gospel, but his first letter, John's even more emphatic. At 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, the apostle writes this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness. Very emphatic about seeing, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. John, in his writings, found it very necessary to fight against a heresy called docetism. The term docetism is derived from the Greek word for seem. Docetism, if you're a note taker, D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M, docetism. The term docetism is derived from the Greek word for seen. I'm sorry, seem with an M. There were false teachers trying to spread the lie that Jesus only seemed human. These false teachers could not accept or imagine why God would possibly want to take on a human body. It didn't make sense to them. And so these docetists taught that Jesus was actually a phantasm. Now that's a Greek word that we can understand as a projection. They taught that Jesus was not actually human but instead seemed human because of a virtual image that was projected from heaven. That is part of the reason why John emphasizes Christ's coming in human form when he says the word became flesh. And it is also a reason why John writes in his first letter, one of the ways to detect a false teacher. At John, at 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, John writes this, Every spirit, which would have directed that false teacher to speak, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is not of God. Clearly, it was extremely important to John that Christ's humanity be emphasized. That's why he speaks of Christ coming in the flesh. And why was that? Why is it so important to John that his humanity be emphasized? Here's why. 
Only if Christ were fully human, in addition to being fully God, could Jesus serve as the perfect sacrifice for our sin. It was a man, Adam, who brought sin into the world. And only God himself could bring the remedy for our sin by coming as a man. Only by coming in the flesh could Christ serve as our substitute and give his life for us on the cross. Let's return to John speaking about Christ's glory. John says, we beheld his glory. Let's ask this question. How did Jesus show or manifest his glory, the glory of God. Let's outline three ways. For the first way, let's turn to John chapter 3, verse 1. Again, John chapter 3, verse 1. And as we are turning to chapter 3, verse 1, we are going to read a report of what happened just after Jesus attended a wedding in Cana. And as we likely know, it was at this wedding that Jesus turned water into wine. This would be the first of his many miracles. Let's look, please, at chapter 3, verse 1. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana, in Galilee, notice, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And so one of the ways John and the other disciples and many others beheld Jesus' glory was through his miracles. We know of a second way that Jesus manifested his glory. And we know this from our recent study in Matthew's gospel. Peter, James, and the author of this gospel, John, they were invited by Jesus to accompany him to the top of a mountain. And we know that mountain today as the Mount of Transfiguration. And in Matthew 17, it says, Jesus' face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. His disciples were given a brief glimpse of his divine glory. But it is the third manifestation of his glory that might be most important. I think the commentator, Gary Berg, is spot on when he explains that for John, the greatest example of Christ's glory is found in his sacrifice on the cross. It is a deep paradox, but in his suffering and shame, we see Christ's greatest glory. As Berg writes, in this gospel, the cross of Christ is again and again described as Christ's glorification. Turn, please, to John chapter 12, verse 12. Again, John chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, this is the feast of the Passover, when they heard that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Well, we know what day this is. It's Palm Sunday. We also know what is going to happen at the end of this week. Jesus will be crucified on a Roman cross. And of course, Jesus knows that too. And so let's jump to chap of, I'm sorry, verse 23. Skip to verse 23, please. Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be 
glorified. From John's perspective, as it should be for us, the greatest example of Christ's glory is that God would leave his heavenly throne, become flesh, so that he could give his life for us while we were yet sinners. Let's go back, please, to John chapter 1 and the 14th verse, because there are more profound truths for us to glean from this verse. And what we want to focus on now are the two clauses that come at the end of the verse, and they describe Christ's glory. I'll read for, uh, verse 14 from the beginning. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Notice now the first clause that describes his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, and second, full of grace and truth. Let's direct our attention to the first clause. And it describes Christ's glory by saying that part of his glory is the result of being the only begotten of the Father. There are some different translations for this part of the verse but let's examine the translation that's found here in the King James because it uses the traditional word begotten. And a key reason I'd like us to examine the word begotten is because it is also a key word in what may be the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The reason it's important for us to get a better understanding of this word is because it is easily misunderstood. The word begotten may lead us to believe that Jesus was created. Even though the first verse of this gospel shows that Christ has existed from eternity past and that there was never a time when Jesus did not exist, some especially the critics of Christianity, will point to this verse and John 3.16 and say that since Jesus was begotten, he must have been created. He must have had a starting point. We will have a closer look at this Greek word, the word that's translated for us as begotten, in a moment. But first, I'm sure that we will agree that a word can have different meanings depending on the context. For example, if I were to say this building is cool, I might mean the temperature is low. Or I might mean this building is impressive. And so the same word can have different meanings in different contexts. The Greek word that is translated for us as begotten can be used to describe the result of one generation giving birth to another. But when it refers to the relationship between God the Father and God the Son, it obviously has to have a different meaning. And in this case, it carries the most literal meaning. I'll explain. The word translated for us as begotten is the Greek word monogenus. It is a compound word, two words stuck together. And both parts of this word will be familiar to us. The prefix mono is simple. It means one or only. If we're listening to music in stereo, sound comes from two speakers. But if we're listening to that sound in mono, it comes in one speaker only. The second part, genus, will also be familiar to us. It means a category or a 
kind of something. It is where we get our English word genus. When biologists speak of a classification in the animal world, one of the terms they use is genus. In ascending order, there are species, genus, family, etc. A genus describes a category or a kind of animal. If we return to our Greek word monogenus, it literally means one of a kind. That is why if you're looking at the NIV, your translation reads, the glory of the one and only. Because Jesus is the only begotten son, he is supremely unique. He is the one and only. There are none like him. And because there are none like him, only Christ can save. And that is to the glory of his holy name. If we look now at the very end of verse 14, we will see the second clause that describes Christ's glory. He comes, quote, full of grace and truth. We will speak more about these divine attributes a little later in the passage, especially as it pertains to grace. But let's make two quick observations here. First, Christ comes full of grace and truth. Notice the word full. He comes full of grace and truth we can infer that grace and truth were available from God before the coming of Christ, but now, with Christ's coming, he brings grace and truth in a new way, with fullness. He comes full of grace and truth. More on that shortly. Let's make a second observation about Jesus coming full of grace and truth. This is a great testament to his glory. Allow me to suggest why John speaks of these two attributes in particular. As Christ brings grace and truth, these must, by necessity, go together. They must come as a pair, grace and truth. Let me explain this assertion. And to do that, let's first ask a question. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. In other words, grace is when God gives us something that we don't deserve. Here's an example. Scripture says that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Clearly, as sinners, we didn't do anything to deserve Christ going to the cross and giving his life for us. His willingness to go to the cross for our sins is completely a function of his grace. And therefore, salvation is also a gift of God's grace. But there is a caveat. While God's grace is nothing that we can earn, God's grace is not something we deserve, and therefore it is a free gift. God does not give his grace, nor does he give his gift of salvation to all people. And here's why. In order to receive his grace we must also receive his truth. See, that's why I'm saying they need to go together. Grace and truth need to go together. They are, in a sense, a package deal. And what is the truth that needs to be received in order to receive God's grace? It is this. There is no other way of salvation other than Jesus Christ. 
That is the truth. Let's remember the word of Christ when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's go please to the next verse, verse 15. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Hmm. This verse refers to John the Baptist. It seems a bit out of place here, especially since we've already been introduced to John the Baptist earlier in the prologue. But I submit the reason that he is mentioned, mentioned again is to further underscore the uniqueness, the one-of-a-kind attribute, the uniqueness of Christ, that there are none like him. Let's hear again the testimony of John the Baptist. He said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, meaning he is superior to me. The one who comes after me is superior to me because he was before me. Let me explain what's going on here. Jesus came after John in two ways. First, Jesus was born after John by six months. This according to Luke chapter 1. And second, Jesus started his ministry after John. We know this because John's ministry was already established at the Jordan River when Jesus came to be baptized. And it was after his baptism that Jesus began his formal ministry. In these two ways, therefore, John the Baptist could speak of Jesus by saying, he who comes after me. That Jesus came after John in terms of birth and ministry is significant. Leon Morris says that in the ancient world, it was widely held that chronological priority, meaning who comes first, meant superiority. This is not a foreign concept to us. In fact, it is likely something to which we can relate. Even today, in the workplace, deference is usually given to those who are there first. It's called seniority. And those who are there longest are often made supervisors because it's generally assumed that those who are on the job the longest have the most knowledge, the most experience. As we heard last week, even after John identified Jesus and declared Jesus is the Messiah, some people maintained their devotion to John the Baptist, perhaps in part because he came first. But John the Baptist insists, he who comes after me is superior to me. Why? because he was before me. While that might seem cryptic and unclear to some, we know exactly what that means because we are reading in this in context and we know what occurred at verse 1. We know from verse 1 that Jesus was before John because Jesus has existed from eternity past. There was never a time when he did not exist. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And now, the Word has become flesh, and in His Shekinah glory, His personally present glory, the Lord Jesus dwells among us. If we will go now to verse 16, we return to the subject of God's grace. Verse 16, and of his fullness, we have all received 
and grace for grace. As John speaks again of Christ's fullness, it looks back to verse 14 that spoke of Christ manifesting his glory by being full, full of grace and truth. Here, John says, we have received his fullness. And when John speaks of we receiving that fullness, he's referring to those who have received Christ, who have believed in his name. These are the ones, believers, who receive his fullness. In this verse, John, the apostle, says, of his fullness, we have all received grace for grace. That is how the New King James reads, grace for grace. But there are other translations of this phrase, and that is because the preposition in the Greek text between the two appearances of the words grace and grace, that preposition is a little tricky. Consequently, there are two alternative translations. One translation we might call the accumulation view. That is because some translations, like the ESV, the English Standard Version, use the pronoun upon. Thus, it is translated grace upon grace. In this view, it is said that Christ piles grace upon grace on believers. That is why the NIV provides a paraphrase when it says, we have all received one blessing after another. But I believe it is the second view that is the preferred view. If we'll call the first one the accumulation view, we will call this one the replacement view. This is the view that is reflected in the translation given by the New King James. In this view, when John says we have received grace for grace, it means that Jesus has replaced or exchanged one kind of grace for another. But if that is the case, we need to ask, in what way has Christ given his grace such that it replaces another kind of grace? I'll give the short answer, and then I'll elaborate. Jesus has, rep Jesus has replaced the Mosaic law and given us the gospel of grace, the good news of grace. In support of this view, let's go on to verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We need to be careful not to, be, not to misunderstand what is said here. It is not the case that when Christ brought his gospel of grace, that God's law was discontinued. In Matthew's gospel, we heard Jesus say, I have not come to abolish the law, I have come to fulfill it. But how does Christ fulfill the law such that he gives grace for grace? Well, the first thing we need to do is to acknowledge that the, the Mosaic law, that is the law that was given through Moses, God's law given through Moses, the Mosaic law, the first thing we need to do is to acknowledge that the Mosaic law was an expression of God's grace. That is why John can speak of the law and still speak of grace for grace. It is important for us to remember that the Mosaic Law was a gift from God. It was designed to give Israel direction, a lamp unto the feet. It was also meant to give protection so that Israel could establish a society that was built not on man's law, but on God's law. 
and in this way be a model for the nations. The people of Israel had done nothing to deserve God's law. It was a function of his grace. And here is how the law shows that it is God's grace. While the law was meant to show mankind how to live, there was an enormously more important purpose for the Mosaic law. It was designed to convict sinners of our inability to keep the law. According to Jewish scholars, there are a total of 613 commandments in the Torah. But set those 600 commandments aside for a moment, and let's consider just the 10 commandments. We know what those are. Surely we can say, I have never murdered. Presumably we could say that. Sure, I, I can say, I have never murdered. But who among us can say, I have never stolen, or I have never coveted, or I have never used the Lord's name in vain? You see, the law is meant to prove that because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, how desperately we need a Savior. Listen, please, to what Paul writes at Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. The law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. And so in his fullness, Jesus has brought us grace for grace. His coming, bringing grace for grace, means, as the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 6, you are not under law but under grace. And therefore, those who have believed in his name can celebrate the truth that we are saved by grace through faith and not of works. All of this to his glory. Let's have another look at verse 17 because as we are unpacking these deep truths that are so densely packed in John's writing, especially here in his prologue, I don't want to miss an important detail. In this verse, verse 17, we're told that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Here is the summit of John's prologue. This is the high point of his grand finale. For the first time in his introduction, we are told that the one who was introduced to us in verse 1 as the word is in fact Jesus Christ. Up until now, the one who was with God in the beginning has been referred to using a series of titles. The word, the life, the light. Now... He is identified by his name, Jesus Christ. When John began his introduction and referred to the word, it might have been possible for the reader to assume that the word might be some impersonal cosmic force, some nebulous, unknowable force. But the word is not an unknowable, impersonal force. The Word is a divine being who is keenly interested in making himself known, and according to his grace, he has done that. Why? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and his name is Jesus and it is the name that is above all names. And he has come to make himself and the Father known. Let's go, please, to the final verse of John's introduction and go to verse 18. No one has seen God 
at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Once again, the uniqueness of Jesus Christ is emphasized. The uniqueness meaning He is the one and only. While no man has ever seen God, Christ has. Before Christ came, mankind had received glimpses of God, but no one had ever truly seen him, seen him in his fullness, not in the fullness of his glory. Isaiah tells us that even the seraphim who surround God's throne must cover their eyes with their angelic wings. But there is one who has seen the Father in all his glory, the only begotten, the one and only Christ, Jesus. From eternity past, God the Son and God the Father have been in perfect unity. And in this verse, we are told that God the Son was in the bosom of the Father. This is an Hebraism. It's a Jewish idiom that indicates a relationship of the most supreme closeness. And what that points to yet again is that Jesus Christ is in the unique position, the one-of-a-kind position to make the Father known. In one of the great scenes in John's gospel, we will hear Jesus say to his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. As we leave now the introduction to John's gospel and we move into the gospel itself, God willing, we will endeavor to see God And according to his will, we will see him because the word became flesh and dwelt among us that we may behold his glory. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are forever grateful that you would leave your throne to come in the flesh. That you came to dwell among us, that we might behold your glory, a glory made known by your presence, but most of all, by the gift of grace that you made when you gave yourself in sacrifice on the cross. Amen.